So good morning. Um, this is the e lecture or the version of e lecture for uh, lecture number two of the housing course ARCG 325 that is entitled Housing Design in the 20th Century An Overview. It is a very long lecture and uh, I will pass through the text quickly because I will be speaking most of it. If you want to revise your notes, you should look into the PDF and um, for study material. Um, this lecture is about making you a kind of an introduction or a resume of um, the main topics when it comes to um, how housing and housing design has evolved since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. As I tried to explain to you last lecture, um, or in lecture one, the housing design was su suffered a shift as the Industrial Revolution uh, takes place. Suddenly, there is a severe housing shortage in most uh, industrialized cities, alongside with the technological development that is happening at the time. Um, this led to uh, a, a very severe condition in terms not only shortage, but also in terms of the sanitary conditions that people were uh, experiencing in, in cities. Also, at the same time, there is at this time, there is a rise of a new middle class that really didn't exist at the time. The society was divided between low classes and high classes, low classes that had lived in very bad conditions and high classes that were very privileged. This middle class, um, this new middle class has a, a purchasing power that it's slightly higher than the low class, but not enough as the high class. So they will demand a new type of houses that actually didn't exist at the time. Uh, so it is a time where architects, engineers, planets and plan and planners and governments in general will start to focus on the, uh, the need to find quick and efficient solutions for these situations. So this lecture kind of presents you a journey uh, that starts with um, the aftermath of the Industrial Revolution that is what we call the paternalist dwelling. Patern paternalistic is a world that comes from the idea of you uh, taking care of people. And it was coined by the fact that industrialists, uh, the owners of factories at the time, felt that it was their obligation to take care of their workers, um, inclusive in terms of accommodation. Then we will move to what we call the positivist dwelling that is basically corresponding to the modernism. Then the post-war dwelling that it's late modernism and uh, the period that um, follows the two world wars. Then the postmodern well dwelling that is divided between the uh, design based on criteria and design based on zoning, and then the contemporary dwelling that uh, is a follow up of the postmodern dwelling that we call design based on time. And this basically represents all the different approach to houses that we have experienced until today. So starting by the paternalistic dwelling, it was actually the company towns, or like I said, the industrial uh, owners that started to uh, show a solution for the housing problems that were existing at the time. Um, cities were very unsanitary, uh, very crowded, and so this um, people that own or wanted to create new industries, they thought that it would be a good idea to just locate these industries in the countryside, in undeveloped areas where uh, the land was cheap and available, but also it was healthier, the air, and close to the natural resources like rivers or forests, if you needed wood, depending on, on the industry. 
but by doing that, the industrialists knew that they would have to create accommodation for those people because at the time the car, the car was a recent invention, there was no public transportation. So they, for them to move their factories, they would have to move the workers with them. But the way they saw it at the time, that was actually a positive aspect because people were living in bad conditions, they didn't have proper houses, so they thought, um, a healthy and happy workforce would be a productive workforce and seem uh, above all a faithful workforce that is what they were aiming at the time many developments appear at the, by this time of what we call company towns uh, they all have more or less the same characteristics this is the image of port sunlight um, that um, the characteristics would be normally mid-rise to low-rise developments, um, basically houses for the laborers. The houses would follow different uh, hierarchies, so uh, depending on your position within the factory. Uh, and it would always include not all, only the accommodations, but also communal buildings such as schools, concerts, swimming pools, church, hotels. And you have to imagine, as I explained to you last time, the living conditions of those people was were really bad, of these laborers were really, really bad. So these company towns at the time represented like a heaven for a laborer. You know, the opportunity of you finally having a decent living condition, a place where you could raise a family and where you would have access to proper health, proper education, and, and above all, the, the idea that you could have a future, that you could improve your life, that didn't exist before. A poor person would always be a poor person and, and so on and so forth. So Port Sunlight, Sunlight is an example in Britain. There are many examples in Britain, like uh, Salter in Yorkshire, Cadbury, Bourneville, New Earswick, but there are also other examples in, in France, in this case, Margaret and Hall uh, in Germany for the Klein industry, crop industry. So there were several examples in all the industrialized areas in the world, um, and but they were all characterized by, at the time, the same characteristic that was this kind of countryside, little house, uh, row houses or individual houses that were quite small, but very decent for uh, the conditions at the time. They were so advanced for their time that they actually inspired Ebenezer Howard in this concept of the garden city. I'm sure you studied before in urban design, the idea of the garden city. It is by this time that Ebenezer Howard, seeing this experiment, proposes the book of the garden cities of tomorrow and then eventually convinces um, the government and uh, architects, Ewan and Parker, in 1908 to design Letchworth. Letchworth was not a company town, was a normal town within the principles of the garden city, but have many similarities to the developments that were happening at the time, such as the low-rise uh, row houses, this um, connection to the greenery and landscape, the organic uh, design, and so on and so forth. Uh, and it also had many similarities to the systems, the social systems that existed in these company towns. For example, um, because the industrialists believe that a happy worker is a faithful worker, they would have all the systems where you can apply part of your salary to save for example, to improve the infrastructure of the company town, to improve the educational facilities. It was not just the owner or your boss that was responsible for it, but all the employers. And they were very happy to improve their town and their, um, uh, because after all, you know, this was something that they believed that was also theirs. Of course, at this time, if you lose your job, that meant you would lose everything. And people were very, very attached to their jobs and to their employees because they felt that if they lose them, they would not have any other options. In the rest of the world, <clears throat> when you were not 
within a company town because they represented maybe 0.5% of all developments in the world. The rest of the world was still suffering for very, very poor conditions. And that's where we, we talk about what we call the proletarian apartment. This is the equivalent, okay, garden cities or uh, sorry, company towns were uh, happening mainly in the countryside, but in the big cities, they were there was still a huge demand for housing and the proletarian apartment is the correspondent the the urban correspondent let's say of the labor accommodation that the company town represents uh, like i said at this time this company towns they will have a huge influence of the and the development of housing in the future but in reality they represent a very small amount of the population the majority of the population still lived in very bad condition in the cities because they needed to be close to the industries that were located in in services that were located in the cities and this uh, booth poverty map of uh, london uh, of a part of London is very representative of it. So, for example, you can see that along the main arteries, you will see red. Red represents middle class residential units because the high class people were living away from these uh, areas because they were very unsanitary. But then you start seeing in you know, as you go away from the main streets, you start seeing that the colors start going from red to blue and to dark blue and black. And this represents the very poor living conditions. So basically you would have the middle class living on the main streets where the buildings were better and the health conditions were better, the air was better. And then as you go inside the plots, the situation would um, decrease uh, very quickly and it would become very scary. For example, uh, also in Berlin in 1875, a census said that 84% of the population had only sleeping places. Like I explained to you last time, we would have like 10 people sharing a bedroom of 10 square meters and, you know, most of the times without kitchens, toilets or anything else. So uh, there it was still in the late 1800s, most population was living in very bad conditions. But this new middle class that was occupying these red zones, they could afford a better life uh, and they could pay for slightly better conditions, but they were still quite um, basic if we compare to the ones in company towns. And this is what we call the proletarian apartment. That is, it's a class that occupies the main roads and blocks that are slightly better, but they are still character. They are heavily built, so very dense. So there is very, as you can see, there is very little uh, voids in the courtyards. The courtyards are reduced to, to a minimum of natural light and ventilation. And normally this these blocks in, in Vienna, in Austria, they are called um, Bacenas, but it doesn't matter the name. They are normally characterized by these long corridors where you will have communal bath and then sometimes or communal kitchens or just a kind of an entry hall that is the kitchen that then connects to a room. And this would be the apartment and you would have, you know, for every so it was a very uh, humble accommodation and this is how the um, uh, middle class was living at the time. As we reach uh, the 1900s and uh, we pass the First World War, um, modernism kicks in and this is a time where we call the positivist dwelling because modernists are inspired by the machine age and all the beauty and um, good things that the, the development and the technological development can bring to the human being. So they, uh, they, they catch the train, as we normally say, of this um, focus that governments are having on improving living, condi living conditions, and especially after the destruction of the First World War, there is such a need to build uh, or rebuild uh, the structures and the cities that were uh, destroyed at the time, that they use this opportunity to start a new wave of housing that is going to be divided between different um, 
different parameters. But we could say that between 1918 and 1945, the positivist, positivist dwelling is based on economy, function, and scale. And then we will, I will explain how uh, this is expressed um, in different designs. So uh, after the World War I, like I said, we, we need to uh, rebuild cities and the governments are overall um, aware of the conditions, the bad conditions that cities are experiencing. And so there is, this, I, there is this new middle class that can pay a little bit more. So this creates the perfect situation for uh, governments and architects to engage on a new uh, era, a new era of housing design where the main aim is to be able to build or develop as many quality dwellings as possible for the working class at an acceptable price. So the focus will be is how in how much can we build as fast as possible, as cheap as possible, but making sure that everyone has the basic living conditions of health, sanitation and overall well-being that it is considered to be necessary. Um, and to achieve that, of course, they have to be pragmatic. And so one of the first characteristics of this time between 18, 1918 and 45 is the idea of minimization. So the architects will spend much time trying to understand how can they create a dwelling that it's suitable for a family, but at the same time as small as possible. And sometimes when we look at the plans, we don't have an idea but if you go there and if you actually measure the area and you compare it to the areas of your houses right now you will see that it's actually a very big difference for example here the beds are against the wall because if you try to put a bed in a normal the way you put it normally in a bedroom a normal bedroom they would not fit um Jacobus uh, Peter Wood was one of the most famous architects at the time to explore solutions of houses that are cheap but suitable but minimal. So he developed this housing unit or width. The, he considered that the minimum width of a house would be 4.2 meters. That is, for example, this example in uh, Kifowek. And in, in this 4.2 meters, you could perfectly fit an entrance with a living area, a stair with a bathroom under it, and then three bedrooms. If you try to, to make the math of it, it, it's really small. Then in Hoek, it develops also a similar system where that is this image over here. So here it's like duplex apartments, and here they are not actually duplex. They are all simplex, but they have this very, very strict optimization of entrance. So you see, for example, here we have you access the staircases and here oh, for example and here you enter the house on the ground floor and you have immediately a very small toilet and then the living area bedroom 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 and kitchen if you see you know one of the characteristics is the completely removal of circulation places spaces because they are a waste of space and at this time you still see um, kitchens and toilets but they are very minimal uh, but at least they start incorporating toilets and kitchens inside the house, unlike what existed in those proletarian apartments before. And then on the other one, you can go up um, here and then you arrive here and you have. So it's basically minimization is about using the minimum uh, dimensions possible to optimize space. Then another characteristic is what we call standardization. I, I showed you this pro project last time, uh, Frankfurt am Main, um, by Ernest May. He and the Germans in um, uh, Frankfurt uh, on the Main uh, were very, very prolific in uh, exploring standardization and also human scale and minimum dimensions that I will speak in the next slide. He starts working with the, the ideas of prefabrications and then standardizations of all sorts of elements like built-in cabinets, everything that you see today, that built-in kitchens, built-in cabinets, 
uh, fit, uh, fittings, standardized fittings like doors, uh, doors frames, furnaces, staircases. None of this at the time was standardized. Nowadays, you can buy all of these things anywhere and they have standard dimensions, but at the time they didn't. And so standardization was very important at this time to make sure that um, you have you can build a house like like a lego like a lego system which makes it obviously much faster than the craftsmanship that existed before so uh, the idea of prefabrication and standardization was something that not that it didn't exist before but it wasn't really explored in residential design and this is the time where as you can see the houses they will have exactly the same windows that were fitted on site exactly the same roofs exactly the same doors because you know building in quantity makes it cheaper but also faster and the factor was what we call the human, human scale that is related to the previous one that is it's at this time that architects like Le Corbusier or the existence existence minimum movement in Germany, which uh, Ernst May was connected, or in the Netherlands, William van Tijen. They are all people, amongst many others, that were exploring the solutions of how much space is necessary to perform the most basic of functions. So this books like the uh, time savers or Neufert or architects data, they were all created at this time or as a consequence of the time and they will not have existed. And nowadays you would not have that book if this effort is how much space is necessary to perform our daily tasks um, had not been made. So and the purpose of this was to make sure that all people, that all houses were small but uncomfortable. They have to ensure that they all have minimum conditions for people to live in a decent way. Um, another issue, sorry, wrong side. Another issue that appears at the time is the idea of function. Um, and I describe one function. Uh, or functional zoning was not a concept that existed before. You know, houses had many rooms, uh, more or less depending on how wealthy the family was, but independently of the number of rooms, those rooms normally didn't have specific functions attributed to it, except uh, in very big palaces or royal houses, maybe some, but still, there was very, very little zoning until the time where this architect in 1925 called Alexander Klein pioneers the concept of functional zoning that we all know today. That is, you would say, you know, we should organize uh, our residential units according to the, the groups of activities that take place in the house, like, for example, for living, sleeping and other functional activities, so that if a family is in a, a flat or apartment, a house, they can perform their activities without bothering each other. So, for example, what you were saying is we cannot have bedrooms next to kitchens or very open to, to kitchens, for example, because then if I'm trying to sleep, I cannot, I cannot sleep because there's too much noise. So he started developing this idea that, you know, we have to zone our compartments or our spaces within the house so to make sure that the different people that are living there can actually access it. So in 25-28, he makes this proposal uh, for a residential competition, a housing competition in Moscow, where he makes sure he makes several proposals and then he, he developed these proposals to time that he makes sure that the apartments are accessed via uh, an, an entrance hall that has natural light and then distributes to the kitchen area and the living area. So, for example, immediately from the entrance, you can access quickly the two main social areas of the house and then the, you have to pass through the social areas to go to the bedrooms because you believe that that's a more intimate area of the house. Eventually, then he start, he continues to develop his plans and he made different upgrades, you know, regarding what, what should be the location of the kitchen and what should the hall exactly connect. Uh, and where should the bathrooms be located. So he made several experience from bathrooms to being accessed from the a hall, from uh, different rooms uh, to kind of explore, you know, this concept of uh, zoning. 
Klein's conceptual approach was based on ensuring functional, non-prestigious plans for low and middle class families with no servants. So he was targeting that amount of the population, not uh, other parameters. Um, so for him, long and confusing corridors uh, or, you know, wastes of space would only contribute to time wasting and the separating of family members. He believed that the home should have different zones that are more public and more private, but also be optimum enough to make sure that the family can encounter each other and, and share moments to, together. Another uh, concept that was developed of the time was the idea of flexibility. <clears throat> and it was mainly discussed by Bruno Taut in 1920 when he talked about the solution of cities where he says that the man is by nature flexible. So in 1920s, Le Corbusier with his Maison de Minot system, he, he pioneered the concept of flexibility because by separating the, the shell from the structure, basically he allows, it's the first time, and we might, again, we might not be aware of that because we do this all the times nowadays with our designs, but it's the first time where the the, the outdoor of the building and the indoor partitions are not connected to structural elements at all. So this meant that you could change all these walls as much as you wanted. And you could also cre could create windows like the modernist, the horizontal continuous windows, or what we see today as the skyscrapers, the curtain walls. That was only possible, and it's only possible today because of Le Corbusier's invention. But then in 1930s, Eric Freiberger um, um, explored the idea of the skeleton that will be very, very famous and it will influence many of our designs today. The idea he evolved on the domino system, that is, you have a structure that is completely independent from the interior partitions. But probably the first architect to actually achieve design flexibility, because these proposals by Le Corbusier and Freiberger were very experimental. But uh, Le Corbusier, in his uh, Weissenhof uh, building in 1927, he really creates a building, a very small, um, low-rise apartment building, where um, he has a flexible apartment with a non-flexible structure, which enables different people to occupy it in different ways, as we can see in the three plans. Basically, the apartment literally allows the configuration and the position of partitions and sliding doors allow you to uh, a different family to uh, occupy it in different ways. So he was actually the first one to explore this idea of sliding partitions, of movable walls to kind of offer what we call today user participation. At the same time, um, it was also at uh, very common for governments to launch competitions to architects. They would um, launch challenges to build entire new neighborhoods. Uh, and these were opportunities that the modernist architects found to really spread their ideals. And I, may, in many ways, one of the reasons why modernists became so famous and, and so important in the history of the world. Um, because they were, these uh, new developments were normally made in outskirts of the cities, were, you know, in uh, new areas that were supposed to be the extension of this very uh, densely populated cities and were opportunities for architects to explore these new ideals of minimization, prefabrication, standardization, and so on. And they were really into it. Weissenhof, like I was saying about Mies, was one of the examples. Um, you can go through it. I'm not going to grow in this case too much through it because they basically resume the principles that I was describing above of minimization, standardization, human scale, uh, function, and flexibility. But basically, they represent um, a very, very rich period of experimentation of these uh, five parameters.
Very important also at the time is that houses, and for the reasons that I explained before, this was not just a house, but it was a neighborhood. Because the living conditions of people were so bad at the time, these developments were supposed to be functional, were supposed to be economical, but they were supposed to bring people back to nature and to a healthy living. So they were very much optimized to have perfectly reception of natural light, natural ventilation, and above all, good air quality. This is the Brits Housing Estate by Bruno Taut in Berlin. It's a very, it's called the Horseshoe, very famous. This is also a very typical placement of uh, buildings at the time that is called the Zeilen, that is the rows of houses, normally four floor apartment buildings that are perpendicular to the street. By being perpendicular to the street, they will move away uh, the building from the hazards of the main street. So, for example, this ones over here have more contact, but a part of the house will be facing the main street and another part will always be facing, facing a public garden. And in this minimizes the contact that you have with the noise and the pollution that happens on the main street and creates these spaces in the middle, these green pockets that allow residents to use it freely. Normally, they are not individual gardens. They are public spaces that anyone can use and where normally those communal facilities are included. Um, <clears throat> in uh, the Brits, there aren't a lot of facilities besides the garden, but as you can see, the average area of houses is 49 meters square, so they were very small. I will show you here an idea. So this is 49 meters square. They were quite humble, but again, the most important was that they were optimum. They received perfect amount of natural light, natural ventilation, and surrounded by greenery. But, for example, the Karl Marx off in Vienna that follows very similar pro uh, principles was located next to the train station so that workers could move easily to their uh, workplaces. Uh, the Karl Marx office state included uh, areas such as uh, community gardens, um, landromats, libraries, bathing facilities, kindergartens, uh, pharmacy, garbage storage, offices, dental clinics, youth organizations, and so on and so forth. So the idea was that this, this residential neighborhoods were more than a house. It was a neighborhood where you would create bonds with other people because they were being built, these estates were being built normally slightly away from the cities in the transportation nodes, so they needed to make sure that people would create an attachment to the site and and feel comfortable and, and, and well. Another example is the Spangen that follows um, similar principles. Um, and it's the first time, the, the interesting thing about this project is the first time that architects start exploring with alternative circulation systems. In this case, uh, Brinkman uh, worked with what we call the street in the sky that will be very famous in the 1970s, the suspended street that uh, is very famous on the 70s and still very famous today like we see here on this photo. Okay, after this period of uh, enormous creativity and exploration based on the five principles that I've described, we reach a period of a halt. That is, after the Second World War and until more or less 1965, that is where the postmodern movement really rises, there is a kind of a crisis. So, at the time is when the Athens Charter is being, uh, the Athens Charter was written uh, around 1933, and it discusses the principles of the functional city. And these principles were, uh, the, it was written by Le Corbusier uh, based on the um, Fourth Siam uh, Congress. And it basically serves as a, a set of recommendations of how cities should be, and it will proclaim most of the principles that we see in the examples that I, I, I showed you before, like residential areas should occupy the best places of the city, and that by that they mean the places with the best topography, climate, sunlight, and availability of green space. The residential zones should be marked by the criteria of health, health environment, uh, densities shouldn't be too big, 
um, all uh, units have to receive a minimum number uh, of uh, hours of sunlight. The alignment of the houses should be along the main streets to provide uh, excess noise and smoke. Um, we should use modern building techniques in high-rise buildings. At the time, it was not possible to build more than five floors or it was not common. Eventually, it will become. That's what they were advocated because they were saying the higher the apartment building, the more green space you will free in the bottom. So they were advocating for high-rise buildings. But these high-rise buildings have to be placed very far away from each other so that they would have, all apartments would have a perfect uh, access to natural light and ventilation. And it is with this, uh, I just resumed the part of the Aten Charter, that is the, the, the area connected, related to dwellings or residential areas. But by, by doing this, Le Corbusier almost sets the tone of what housing should be. And many of these buildings that I was showing, you follow these parameters. But at the time, densities were not very high and buildings were also not very high because the the elevator was still a very new thing. Construction techniques were also new. So the buildings couldn't actually be very tall. So they always have this very nice looking appearance of houses in the middle of greenery. But by this time, by 1945, the situation changes because there is still a very big housing shortage. There is a lot of people coming from the war, uh, soldiers that fought, fought in the war and, and, and need a house and their families. Um, and above all, the amount of, of the need of, of houses, the, the less and less amount of available land, and the evolution of technology, especially in terms of lifts and elevators and the prefabrication techniques, allows this period to be marked by higher densities and higher buildings. And because th these buildings are very big, they stand out a lot and they all have the same characteristic that it's marked by prefabricated elements. So we reach a point that later on will be called, for many, it will be called brutalism, but it actually, it was not a of a style. It was the consequence of buildings that are very tall in the middle of the landscape, of the urban landscape, so they stand out a lot, all being uh, built with prefabricated elements that normally based on concrete. The Unité d'Habitation by Le Corbusier in 1952 is probably the, I would say, the building that represents this moment. There are many others, and you can see many others, probably your case studies have, but the Unité represents the epitome or the, the high point of this period. That is that because it follows uh, Athens Charter, the principles that Le Corbusier itself implemented. So he suggested that the entire city of Marseille, where this was built, would be re completely torn down and made into a green field. And then these unites would be placed in the middle of the landscape. Uh, this way, all the citizens will have perfect views, perfect amount of natural light, natural ventilation, and therefore good living conditions. The way the unity was designed was this, this idea of a vertical city, or what we call today a vertical city. So you would have in one building, you would have um, in the middle of the building, a commercial street with all the basic facilities that a person might need, like the bakery, the supermarket, you know, like common shops for day-to-day -day activities. And then in the bottom, you would have this very uh, wide green landscape for people to go out and walk, exercise and so on. And then on the upper floor, oh, and the bottom, you would also have a kindergarten or a nursery for then parents that are living to work, they could leave their children there. And another facility that I actually can't remember this at the time, that I think it was a community hall. And then on the roof, you had what he called the leisure area, where you would have a small pool for children, the youth club, a running track, 
and other facilities that were meant for residents to, to gather. So it was literally, it is how the concept of the vertical city and the, the self-sufficient city starts. That is a building that holds everything. So suddenly you don't have a, a typical city anymore where you have the commercial area or the educational area. No, you have a building that has everything on it. And between these buildings, you just have greenery and roads and nothing else. Um, his organization of duplex apartments at the time is also extremely uh, revolutionary because with the idea of optimization and minimization, what he did is he managed to create duplex apartments that are very long and narrow but still have the proper amount of natural light and ventilation. The longer an apartment is, the easier it is for you, the more the higher number of units you can put because if apartment buildings are constrained by the amount of natural light the deeper it is the less wider your facade has to be for you to have the necessary area the problem is if it's very narrow what happens is then you you don't have enough light and ventilation to come to the center so what he did is he created duplex apartments where this area next to the window is always a double height so now see like here uh, if you just have one floor if you look at the section if you just have one floor the amount of natural light that will penetrate the building will only reach five meters but if you have a double height then this doubles to 10 meters by doing this, not only created apartments that can be very narrow and long, which again, today they would never be possible. You can look at the beds and, and see how narrow and long these bedrooms are, but um, were quite interesting at the time, considering the living conditions of people. So not only managed to do that, but he also managed to completely minimize to is bare minimum the amount of communal circulation because you have one corridor to serve three floors of apartments which is a very difficult thing to achieve normally you have one corridor per floor uh, and these are just some images of how it looks like it's actually a very pleasant building if we consider you know how narrow and and constrained it is at the same time inspired by this concept of the unité d'habitation uh, the interbau in berlin in 1957 so after the construction of unité d'habitation follows the same principle so different architects uh, are going to make a plan like in the previous building exhibitions going to make plans of different residential buildings that all have similar characteristics so it's a building that is set away from the main roads surrounded by greenery and with similar facilities this is the concept of alvaralto that at the time alvarado has always been a much more sensitive architect so he developed this building that is this is alvaralto building uh, a building that uh, has a much more squarish frame it's a 90 degree um, double oriented uh, unit centralized on the living area because in his opinion um, it would um, you know for you to have a good family environment you have to make sure that the family contacts with each other while in his opinion Le Corbusier plan even if it has this double height it is very long and narrow and therefore people are more separated from each other let's put it like this so this is the post-war period, which is much overall much less creative than before. And it's also marked, so one hand, we have these reactions that are like a continuation of the positivist approach, based many very, very uh, influenced by the Athens Charter. But then you have a kind of a crisis or a reaction to, to all of this that is happening. That is what we call the philosophic approach. This approach is going to completely shift the way houses were being interpreted at the time and housing design were, were being interpreted at the time. Uh, the overall lack of innovation makes and, and, and experiencing this in the new cities, right? because these buildings are being built and people are living on them and are experiencing it, they really 
lead to a reaction of the common population because they are very the, the cities are becoming very dense buildings all look the same they are very monofunctional um and people start feeling that that's not really a good way to go because most of the times even when you have these buildings amongst the greenery then no one plants the greenery it's not taken care of and so you have an area that ideally was was going to be very beautiful very green very healthy but then in reality it's not really so much so so at this time philosophers uh, start getting involved in housing issues because they believe that you know all this focus on technology and minimization and standardization is really taking the focus of what is important so in 1951 heidegger a German philosopher writes an essay called Building Dwelling Thinking, where he tries to understand, he basically makes a reflection about the meaning and nature of being and things. And in his analysis, okay, as he started, he was speaking generally, but as he started, um, he starts discussing of, uh, you know, the nature, when he starts, when he's discussing the nature of humans, he, he starts reflecting on how humans are so connected to their home or what i try to explain you uh, or to to dwelling so he starts to make like a kind of a, an interpretation of the origin of certain words and he comes to the conclusion that people don't understand the nature of dwelling anymore and and this is the fault of the modernity or, or the modern movement, or in this case, the positivist dwelling. That is, they are so focused on technology that they just forget or forgot what is important. And in his opinion, what is important is that people go back to nature, renouncing in a certain way this technology technology or the invasion of technology and he gives the example as a perfect example though the house in the woods or in the forest has been the perfect place where you feel in connection to your home because you build that house you build that cavern and you feel there that you are in connection to not only your house but also to nature this line of thought if we think about it, is the complete opposite of the modernity. And it will be very influential uh, during the 70s. Uh, architects like Rainer Banham, Venturi, Bofill are all architects that are going to be heavily influenced by this idea of what makes us feel comfortable or feel connected to, to our houses. It's not that they completely refuse technological advancements, but they just say that we have to refocus our relationship with nature where memory replaces the value of progress in a way you know technology should serve us but we shouldn't be a servant of it an example is la moraja Roja by ricardo bofill it's a building that is inspired by the moroccan medinas or the souk um uh, is a very introverted so it's this is an actually a, a mid-rise building it has around six seven floors depending on where you are and it's completely inspired in the experience that you would have in an arab setting in this case in morocco that's where he uh, lived a big part of his life this is just for you to have an idea it's a completely introverted design very modular where you know uh, the structure follows the structure of the houses follows a very it's like uh, squares that are added in a modular movement that with very, very tiny windows that all have shutters and um, very modular. So allows the apartments to have many, many different um, compositions and sizes. And it has the circulation space has this characteristic, which is <coughs> very very interesting um, and very introverted and also very suitable because this is in Barcelona, which is the south of Spain, which, as you know, it's quite uh, quite hot and uh, humid sometimes. On the other sense, so this is existentialism. So it's this idea of going back to nature and to history to inspire yourself in history. At the same time, there is another movement that it's called phenomenology 
that feeds on existentialism uh, thinking, but focus mainly on the idea of perception and experience. So Merleau-Ponty um, is one of its um, main um, influencers that in 1945 writes phenomenal, phenomenology and perception. Uh, so he basically focused on the idea of perception that is, the perception of the individual is activated by us, and it's all about the idea of experience. Gaston Bachelard, on the other hand, when he writes The Poetics of Space in 1957, fo focus on the idea of perception being activated by memory. So, Ponty is about experience, how do we experience space? Bachelard is uh, focused on the idea that our perception is activated by memory. What do, does it mean? The best way that I can demonstrate this to you is by, for example, this images that I'm guessing you could find many others. This is Picasso House, is summer house. And Picasso House, if we look at it, is a house that I think we can recognize. I mean, we are all different people, but I think we can understand what this means. That is, it's a place of mess. It's a place where a lot of objects come together. They don't necessarily match. They don't necessarily uh, go together. But it's a place that it's made of our memories and uh, of our experiences. It's where we had our best moments, and that's why we feel comfortable there. The problem is, it's a different, it's a house that has a different type of materiality, more than a craftsman, than an engineer. So it's almost like the opposite of everything that the modernists were saying. It's a, it's a house made of disorder, of personal objects uh, that are not necessary, of space that is not necessary. So it's about a house that is made of the memories of the individual. Now, the problem of this type of design is a phenomenological house is an emotional filter, complex and sensitive, impossible to determine limits or stability. It's like a semi-open entity, a space of transition where we have a, a complexity of, of memories and, and events being organized. From this perspective, all houses are phenomenological because, like I explained to you in lecture one, if a dwelling is a place that we have to inhabit, any house can become phenomenologic with the pass of time. So by, by, from that perspective, how do you create a phenomenological house? For them, it's much more about a focus on the individual and a focus on, on revisiting past memories. That's very dangerous because how can you do that when you have to design a building for 500 people? It's very difficult. And the architects that explore phenomenology are perfectly aware of the limitations. So they try to explore general feelings and perceptions that they believe affect our mood and our connection to places. Is what we call, and I think you, you, if you didn't study it, you will study it in this theory of architecture, the, sense, the difference between space and place. For example, the Canalese House by Yudson is one of these examples. It celebrates the Mediterranean climate and located in Mallorca, Spain. <clears throat> it's a house that when you look at the plan doesn't seem to make much sense. So basically you have four squares of different functions with windows with many different forms, indoors and outdoor spaces that you don't understand very well the hierarchy because it's a house that responds to nature, to the views and above all, to an experience. This is mostly image of the outside, so you barely can understand what is the difference between in inside and outside, but you can see that there are different axes of natural light, there are different types of framing views, there are different places where you can sit, where you can run, where you can reflect. So it's a house that enhances your senses. And in that sense, um, 
it becomes normally very difficult to separate existentialism from phenomenology. The way I normally uh, explain it is existentialism is not necessarily about perception, but about nature and memory, while phenomenology, yes, it normally grabs on nature, but not necessarily, because it's about exploring what makes us feel connected, what makes us have a sense of place. And here, you will notice that the materials are very uniform and overall what Yutsen decided to do, you know, is to create a uniform flowing space that just melts with its surroundings and offers you different pockets of spaces that have very different characteristics, very different light that just makes you feel in connection to the world that is surrounding you. Another architect that explored this uh, concept a lot was Aldo van Eyck. For him, the way he explained it uh, was for you to design a phenomenological house, you have to have a place to place design. That is, you have to design uh, houses in this case as having different locals of operation. So if you have first you have to think how you connect spaces with one another and you have to make sure that each space has a specific characteristic that people can connect to and identify. For example, in this house, the entrance is more enclosed because the street is on the back, but you have this curved dining area where you know, that has this very specific feature that people most likely will like and find interesting. And the way he thinks about the flow from the staircase to the living room, to then to the garden, having different shapes, different forms, it's how he highlights this idea of flow and, and the creation of places instead of spaces. So these architects are not concerned with optimization they are concerned with the experience that user has inside the house. After this period, around the 1960s, is where we reach the postmodern dwelling. And the postmodern times, postmodernism is basically a reaction to modernism. At this time, even if the philosophers in the post-war periods, the philosophers are going to be the first postmodernists, but they are still in a period, and they are philosophers, they are not architects, we are still in a period where the majority of the world is following um, um, modernism. It's uh, in postmodern around the 60s that architects really start to question the effect, effectiveness of the Athens Charter and, and really propose alternative solutions. So it's a period uh, marked by a rejection of the urban design approaches of Le Corbusier, amongst many others, and the revival to concepts that they believe are more suitable for the human scale. Because yes, the modernists were concerned with the human scale, but in terms of what is the minimum area necessary, what they are saying is, inspired by the philosophers is they are saying, no, but what is necessary for us to feel comfortable, which is a very different thing. So uh, this period is also characterized by major urban expansions, high rise apartments in a continuation of what was happening because they, they cannot change that city. There is less space available, land available in cities and, and the technology is allowing for higher buildings. So a little bit like what is happening in Bahrain today, there is no option but to go up. And this is also a period that is going to be very influenced by the prefabrication materials that was opened uh, before. Because of the lack of available land, there will also be a reduction of the green areas and open spaces between buildings. So it's an area that even is an, a time that even if architects are very much aware that we have to go back to human scale, it's a time that really continues the problems that the post-war era actually accentuates the problems that the post-war era had. Um, one of the architects that will try to fight against this tendency is Alison and Peter Smithson that develop what we call the um, <clears throat> criteria for mass housing. They believe that houses should follow criteria that are literally a reaction to the criteria that the Autumn's Charter defined. They believe that if you want to design successful uh, dwellings, you have to define criteria that take into consideration not only measurements, 
like the modernists did, but also spiritual and the emotional well-being of the resonance. And so they develop a criteria that uh, that you can uh, see, you can access on uh, your study material. I'm not going to go through it, but basically the criteria has a set of three different parameters. That is the relationship of the residents with the city, the relationship of the residents with the building, and the relationship of the residents within the dwelling. And it covers parameters that cover technology, dimensions, but also um, our perception and our well-being or what we call the human scale. This is an example of the Golden Lane Project competition that is very fam famous by the Smithsons in 1952. They, it's the first time that they explore in the middle of the city of London the creation of neighborhoods, the suspended street, like Brinkman, I told you about that, uh, like Brinkman uh, developed in the 1920s. They are going to explore it now, all with the objective of creating residential areas where people feel connected to and not just a place where they go to just sleep at the end of the day. Uh, this is what I call about the concept of the street in the sky. Um, the Robin, Robin Hood Gardens were, was actually built, unlike that competition. And you can see that, you know, the buildings have this very common uh, as, uh, appearance that is very common in the 70s. But the way they try to design the green areas in between the buildings is really focusing on making people feel comfortable within the city. So you have the buildings that face the main streets and literally it's like arms that are protecting that green area that has those hills so that you just don't see a flat green lawn. You will have pockets of activities that different age groups, different people with different interests can, can accommodate. I'm not going to go through the flats, but they are also very interesting. Uh, it's important that you understand the concept of the suspended street. The Smithsons also drove inspiration for Le Corbusier because they didn't thought that everything that the modernists did was bad. They just thought that they could be better. So they follow the modernists in the concept of the um, only having corridors every three floors because that really uh, reduces the cost in terms of circulation. So they have this apartment very much inspired on the Unité d'Habitation where from the main corridor that is the yellow, you can enter your flat that is number two or you can and then go up or you can enter the flat that is in a darker color and then go uh, down. So this allows you to, if you go up, you go to this duplex, and if you go down, you go to this duplex. That is, uh, this is a two bedroom and this is a three bedroom. So they they still use many of the concepts of Le Corbusier and other modernists, but they literally are going to evolve on that to create environments that they believe uh, follow criteria that are more suitable to create good neighborhoods where people feel attached to, to each other. At this time, there is also the concept of design based on zoning that was developed mainly by Habreken uh, in the Netherlands and the SAR that was the Foundation for Architectural Research in the Netherlands. They are going to uh, develop on this idea of flexibility that the modernists uh, pioneered, like I spoke to you before. So in the way they are thinking is the problem of the modernists is that they just assume that everyone is the same. And the same as the Smithsons, they are saying we have to understand that people need to have a bigger input in their houses so that they feel attached to them. They, of course, they were in, inspired by the philosopher's uh, speech. So they developed this concept of supports that basically says, what if we build structures that are structural elements where people could literally choose how to configure the apartments inside? This way, we could have people that are able to customize whatever they want to do. And this was the beginning of a thing that is very common today called um, user participation. <clears throat> they develop entire systems 
of basically it would be like units like a lego system where you would choose they would uh, uh, size different types of bedrooms living areas kitchens and then you could literally choose what is the one that you want and then place them within the structure that was being developed so there was a grid system of 10 by 20 and within that grid system there was a kind of a rule so for example I will explain better here. Within an apartment building, there are circulation areas. Circulation areas cannot be occupied because it's where we walk. And then there is a gradient um, system that represent water areas and then movable areas. So they would say the darker one is where you circulate means you cannot move it. Then the dark gray area is an area where water uh, kitchens and toilets have to be located. So it's like normally next to the corridor. And then the lighter gray area is an area where you can place any other function. So like we can see here. This would allow for maximum flexibilization of uh, units. So they would come as main structures and then inside you could occupy within the gray areas and white areas that you have in your building and this is an example of a prefabricated system in um, Belgemere housing projects that are actually built and it was quite successful um, so basically all the walls and uh, doors and partitions were prefabricated on site and then according to what you would choose on plan they would just build it for you there in the line of thought of this uh, post-modern approaches, we reach the time of contemporary. And contemporary dwellings are very much inspired by those experiences. Um, normally, because at this time, as the 70s pass and 80s, uh, growing criticism of functionalism led to an increased attention among designers towards the treatment of the unexpected and towards the flexibility of the dwelling so they would say we cannot think like the modernists we have to accept that humans need to have their own choice and above all besides giving them choice the passage of time is very important when i get married I might think of a house for my children, but then my children will grow up. I don't know how many children I will have, and then they will grow up, they will leave the house, and it will still be my house. Because normally when someone buys a house, they buy it for life. So they were saying it's very important that we are able to give them choice in the initial design, but it's also very important that we give them structures that are able to absorb the passage of time. And this is where the two main approaches that uh, contemporary architecture has to design come from. That is the concept of polyvalent dwellings and the frame concept that is basically an evolution of the work of Abraken and the Saar in the Netherlands. An example of a polyvalent dwelling is, for example, the work of Hermann Erzberger, Diagon Housing. There are others, but basically it means that the dwelling can be used in different ways. How do you do that? These are row houses, and what he did, he created a kind of a grid where it's like kind of two L shapes. It's not really L shapes, like two rectangles that are <clears throat> uh, of similar shape and size that are arranged in half floors. A half floor, I will move forward so that you can see, a half floor is what you see in this drawing. That is, each floor is each rectangle, it's half floor above the other. What does this create? This creates a easier connection between floors, visual connection, and an easier physical connection, okay? So, and what happens is you have this similar shaped uh, spaces that are connected by the staircases and normally water areas like toilets. So what happens is you access here, there is a garage, and then every time you go up half a floor, you reach a certain area of the house. So you go up, half a floor you reach the sitting area then half a floor you have this kind of kitchen dining slash bedroom slash office area you go up another one you have another bedroom area with another toilet and then you have this area on the top so what happens is you would say we have similar rectangles that have natural light because there is a um, uh, north, uh, there is not only light coming from the windows, but also from this uh, entrance of light here from the middle. So not only you allow people to choose 
how they are going to occupy their space, but it always has enough light and ventilation. And above all, it always has communication, visual communication amongst people. And for him, that is the secret of um, flexibility or polyvalency. That is, I can choose to occupy my house as I see fit. I still have privacy, but I'm still connected with my family. And these are some images of how the house look like. The concept of the frame is, like I say, is a much more direct evolution of the work of um, heartbreaking in the Netherlands, and it's very used in the Netherlands, of course. That this is an example, but you can see it in many other buildings. That is, you design a building that is in the center of the city, so it's a building that literally goes over an old building. Um, it's also very typical of this time. We live in times where a lot of refurbishment has to take place. A lot of heritage buildings need to be, but then you have to grow over them. So it's a building that really represents contemporary times. And what they have developed is, I will go, uh, basically this is the old building and uh, this is a new building. And what they have developed is basically squares, uh, rectangular or squarish spaces where you can literally build almost whatever you want. So the black represents, and this parts over here represent shafts where the pipes and the ventilation will run. And then you have this building, This uh, you have a floating uh, floor that allows all pipes and cables to pass. You have also a floating ceiling or a suspended ceiling. And then all the water areas should be located close to the entrance area because it's where the shafts are. And then all the rest of the space can be configured quite freely. And it allows you for an endless, an endless array of possibilities. Even toilets, because of the floating floor, can actually be moved, but they have to be closer to the entrance area. And these are also some of the images. So this is a resume of this is uh, the resume of lecture two. I hope it was helpful. Uh, as with all lectures, I always leave a sample question in case uh, you want to study and prepare yourself for the final exam. As I explained to you previously, the final exam will be mainly focused on uh, essay questions. So once you are studying for your final exam, I always advise all the students to go through the questions on each lecture and try it out and basically try to answer to the questions um, as a practice. Uh, also, after there is the study references, uh, that you can find them all in your uh, folder or study folder. These two are the main references of where this information was taken from, in case you want to add a little bit more to what I shared with you. But then a secondary rhythm, reading material that is important is the Athens Charter, all of it, you should know it. Um, the texts of Bachelard and Heidegger for phenomenology and uh, existentialism. Again, I resumed it very quickly. You should at least, you should read the text, and then the Smithson's uh, criteria for mass housing. You can just click on the link. It will give you a better overview than what I gave to you of what are the this criteria that they have uh, established. So, thank you for watching or assisting, and I will see you in lecture three.